Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ellie Bomstein from the Wallace Center at Winrock International, calling you today from sweaty Arlington, Virginia. Uh, welcome to this National Good Food Network webinar entitled Value Chain Coordination, Bringing People Together. Thank you for joining us today. I'm going to say a few words about the Wallace Center and the National Good Food Network to those of you that are joining us for the first time. Uh, the Wallace Center is a business unit of Winrock International, and we are the host of the National Good Food Network webinars. Wallace Center has been a leading organization in the movement for a more sustainable and equitable food system for over 30 years. We're actually almost at our 35th anniversary. Uh, we develop partnerships, pilot new ideas, and advance solutions to strengthen communities through resilient farming and food systems. The National Good Food Network, or NGFN, is an initiative of the Wallace Center that accelerates progress towards the Wallace Center's vision. The NGFN is a connector. We connect peer-to-peer, peer-to-expert, and practitioners to best practices and lessons learned. We do all of this at a national scale so that innovation spread rapidly throughout the good food world. You can learn more about the work of the Wallace Center at wallacecenter.org and about the National Good Food Network at ngfn.org. We encourage you to dig into all of the resources on those sites, including our large collection of archived webinars. This webinar is the second of a four-part series on the practice of value chain coordination. You can visit ngfn.org to watch the first webinar, which is more of an intro to value chain coordination. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about one of the key roles of VCC work, which is convening. Uh, convening is basically just getting the right people in a room together, which we'll learn is both an art and a science. VCCs try to take a systems level view and think critically about who isn't talking to each other but should be. Convening is one way to solve that problem. It's easy to know how many people showed up to a convening, but can be a lot harder and much more important to know how many new relationships were formed. So today we'll hear from a VCC who is working in a nonprofit, a VCC working in a for-profit, and a researcher on trying to understand their roles on how to host and evaluate two different kind of convenings. I'm going to introduce our panelists. Uh, who are Sarah Rocker, Ann Carlin, and Mark Brault. Uh, Sarah Rocker is a PhD candidate in rural sociology in the Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Economics, Sociology, and Education at Penn State, and a researcher at the Northeast Regional Center for Rural Development, where she works at the intersection of food systems, agricultural change, and development. Sarah holds a master's in public administration with a focus on food policy from the Evergreen State College and an MA from the University of Colorado. She also consults with agencies, businesses, and organizations on topics including farmer livelihood strategies, value chain development, planning for native species, agroforestry crops, and coordination and evaluation strategies of food systems. We're also going to hear from Anne Carlin. Anne has 20 years of experience in promoting local food systems. From 2000 to 2017, she launched and ran Fair Food, a nonprofit organization in Philadelphia that developed new wholesale markets for farmers and operated the Fair Food Farm Stand in Reading Terminal Market. Since 2014, she has held the position of faculty director of the Food Hub Management Certificate Program at the University of Vermont. In 2018, Anne launched Third Wheel Cheese Company, a wholesale distribution business specializing in local and regional farmstead and artisan cheeses. Thirdly, we have Mark Brault, who is co-founder and CEO at Deer Creek Malt House, the first commercial malting operation in Pennsylvania since Prohibition. Mark is a scientist, craftsman, and supply chain professional who has lived and worked in the greater Philadelphia area for the last 19 years. He has a diverse background from research to commercialization through leadership roles in biotechnology, pharmaceutical, and agricultural sectors. He has a BS in biology from Lafayette College, an MS in immunology and microbiology from Thomas Jefferson University, and an MBA in strategic management from Villanova. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Sarah, who's going to serve as sort of the MC moderator uh, for the panelists today. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks so much, Ellie. And I'll wait the controls to get shifted over to. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. We're excited to talk with you today. Um, in front of you is our agenda of the topics that we'd like to cover in talking about what we find most relevant to hosting and executing and evaluating convening events. Today we're going to talk about these six elements um, that we find as important steps to planning um, convening events. Even though uh, we will be presenting these today in this sort of linear fashion, we very much want to acknowledge that this is an iterative process and there are multiple um, chances for reflection and revisiting these steps. 
uh, we're going to be doing this primarily in sort of a conversational and comparative uh, manner in which both Anne and Mark will talk about their two main convening events and their tips and strategies for each of these sections. At the end, we'll leave time, hopefully, for a really rich and robust uh, question and answer, and we look forward to your questions and comments at the end. To get us started, we're going to launch into sort of uh, step one, which is identifying purpose of convening events. And so in order to kind of guide our conversation around the purpose, uh, we're just gonna see these two sort of questions. What's the need that is driving your event and how will your event address that need? To answer those questions, I'm gonna hand it over to Anne, who's gonna actually in this first section uh, describe the event uh, purpose and history of the Philadelphia um, Fair Food, Philly Farm and Food Fest, there we go. <laughs> Okay, well, hi everybody. This is Ann Carlin, and I'm here today to talk primarily about Philly Farm and Food Fest, which is, as you'll learn, a large scale local food expo now in its fifth year. But whenever I'm talking to a group of my peers, um, and by peers I mean those of you out there on the call who run these types of events or are considering running these types of events, I like to include Philly Farm and Food Fest's origin story. Uh, because otherwise it can look as though Philly Farm and Food Fest materialized out of thin air, which it absolutely did not. So I'll just start by saying Fair Food, which is the, the organization I ran up until last year, was founded in 2000. And we began an event called Local Grower, Local Buyer uh, in 2002, so very early on in the life of our nonprofit. Um, I always joke that the name of the event is proof of how little we knew about running events because local grower, local buyer is really hard to say and it doesn't abbreviate very well. Moving forward, though, I will probably call it LGLB. Uh, Fair Foods' mission was to build the local food marketplace, and our goal with LGLB was to connect wholesale buyers with farmers and producers who were ready to sell to wholesale markets and looking for customers. So here in this slide, I've highlighted in green uh, what drove the event? As Sarah said, we want to talk about what's driving your event. Um, and so in green here, you'll see industry only was really the most important part about this event. It was strictly industry only. And we worked really hard um, to get all the important buyers in the room by catering the event to their needs. So I've highlighted in blue how we did this. As you can see, the event was on a Monday night, which is always convenient for chefs. It was located uh, at Reading Terminal Market, which is very central, an easy place for folks to get to. Um, it was an expo style event and really most importantly were the exhibitors. So the farmers and artisan producers who, as I said before, were wholesale ready uh, and looking for new customers. Uh, so Sarah, do you want to advance the slide? Okay, great. So uh, Philly Farm and Food Fest, which from this point on, I will probably call PF3. Uh, so Fair Food ran LGLB for 10 years. And throughout it all, local grower, local buyer remained industry only and core to its mission of growing the local food marketplace by connecting wholesale buyers and producers um, to one another. Uh, but then, you know, about 10 years in, a couple of important things happened. Most significantly was the explosion of the artisan food movement, and with it, a loud cry for many of our core producer constituents for a consumer-focused event. A second key factor, uh, Fair Food was approached by another organization to partner on a large-scale food and farming expo. And the third key factor was that we, as an organization, had a desire to raise money with this event. Um, so through all this growth and transition, Fair Food didn't want to lose its focus on the wholesale marketplace. So uh, we launched PF3 with the goal of serving both the consumer and the buyer audience. And I'll be talking later uh, in the presentation about the challenge of doing that. But for now, um, see the areas highlighted in green to understand what was driving the decisions for this event. It was primarily focused on the general public. Uh, we needed to get three to 4,000 people in the room, um, you know, attendance uh, for it to really make sense. And we needed to raise enough money to exceed our cost to throw money back to the host organizations. So again, highlighted in blue are the key decisions we made based on those drivers. Uh, a really big one was the Pennsylvania Convention Center. And for those of you out there who have ever worked in a convention center setting, it has a lot of challenges. But it was really the only place in Philadelphia big enough to hold this kind of event. Um, 
And then the other big thing was corporate sponsorship. For the first time, um, my organization really got into the role of um, raising, uh, you know, money that we'd never really raised before. Um, so, and then at the bottom there, you can see uh, in 2016, uh, we had a really good year in terms of net revenue. And in 2017, we did not. And I will talk about that later in the presentation as well. So I'll hand it over to Mark now. Hi, everyone. I'm Mark. Um, although I was introduced as a, a, a maltster, I really do consider myself a value chain coordinator. Before we started Deer Creek, I spent a lot of time uh, working at uh, Merck, uh, managing a global uh, value chain for the vaccine franchise. And uh, the need for our convening event, the Philadelphia Grain and Malt Symposium, was really driven out of our desire to start a business that existed in the middle of a very immature um, uh, supply chain. Although there was a lot of people growing grain uh, in the Philadelphia region and a lot of brewers and distillers and uh, food artisans, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, activity in the middle of the value chain connecting uh, farmers, producers uh, with the folks using grain and malt. And uh, we wanted to start uh, addressing that and uh, adding value and uh, hopefully building a business around it and uh, realized really quickly that uh, we needed to start bringing people together and coordinating events. Uh, the Grain and Malt Symposium actually, uh, although it's only existed uh, formally under this title for, for two years as a more organized event, um, we started hosting uh, convening meetings uh, back in 2012 uh, when we planted malting barley for the first time and we were trying to figure out what it was going to take to make malt with it and uh, and get it to, to brewers, bakers, and distillers in the region. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, what malt is on the call, um, it's, it's grain that's been modified through the process of germination and then dried and cured in different ways to create uh, colors and flavors um, and uh, a modified agricultural product essentially that can then be used for uh, certain food and, and beverage applications. Um, so we just started bringing people together and uh, we pulled together some farmers, uh, some brewers, some distillers, some bakers, uh, some folks from the uh, local extension, uh, agronomists, and just started having a dialogue to figure out what it was going to take to uh, build infrastructure uh, to improve and shorten uh, the local grain and, and malt value chain. Uh, that has sort of manifested itself uh, the last two years, like I mentioned, in a, a more organized conference, a symposium. Um, where our, our mission really is just that, to bring folks together, to try and uh, network and uh, build a, a more sustainable grain and malt value chain. And uh, we've been having this the last two years at the University of Sciences, really bootstrapping it, and didn't have much of a budget and have been figuring out the economics the past few years, and we'll share a little bit of data uh, on that uh, in some subsequent slides. but. Uh, that really is where the need for this convening event uh, was born, uh, out of our desire to uh, make malt and um, be a participant in a very complex and immature value chain in the Mid-Atlantic. Thanks so much to uh, Anne and Mark for letting us hear a little bit about the scope and the purpose of these main events that we'll be talking about today. Now we're going to move on to the next section. Now that you've heard a little bit about the size and scope and also the intent of these. We're going to turn back to Ann and Mark and talk about how these events were funded, including some of the commonalities as well as what's different. Okay, so um, what I've done here uh, on the left, um, we're looking at the high level budget numbers for PF3 in both 2016 and 2017. I feel like better than any explanation that I can give you, um, the numbers really show the scale of the event. If you remember back to the LGLB slide, um, you know, we had a total budget for, of about $5,000. You know, for 10 years, we ran that event on, you know, $5,000 a year. 
Uh, and so when we uh, moved into Philly Farm and Food Fest, we were really moving into new territory. You know, for a small organization, a small nonprofit organization like Fair Food, doing an event like this is really a heavy lift. Um, but it was one that we were really happy to do every year, primarily because the event was spectacular. That's one reason. Um, but also because it fulfilled our mission of expanding the local food marketplace. Uh, so on the right, um, I have pulled out um, two uh, revenue and expense items for both 2016 and 2017. Um, these are the things that really made the difference between ending the year with some money in our pockets and ending the year with a loss. And uh, more than just that, I think it, again, also just sort of shows, um, you know, sort of the work that m the organization had to do in order to make this event go. So sponsorship revenue was such a big part of how we funded our event. Um, as I mentioned, it was a public event, and um, you can see in the slide there a lot of the different um, companies that wanted to support us and get their name attached to our event and, and be present there. Um, so in 2016, with over $84,000 in sponsorship, and then look what happened in 2017. I just, I'm, I'm guessing that there are people on this call that remember what was happening in 2016. Uh, most significantly for us was that Whole Foods Market, who had been our lead sponsor from the beginning of the event at the tune of about $30,000 a year, um, they started going through a really massive restructuring and significantly downsized their marketing department. So the bad news was we were losing Whole Foods. The good news was um, that Chipotle was ready to take over the, lo the, the role of lead sponsor. We'd been um, they'd been a lower level sponsor. We'd been courting them for years. And so the good news was they were ready to move into that role. And then again, the bad news is, um, if anybody remembers, the salmonella outbreak that happened at Chipotle, and they had to pull back. So we went into um, the 2017 event thinking that we really had our sponsorship situation all figured out, and, um, and then things happened, and we didn't. The other thing that really changed um, in 2017 was that we uh, really upped the professional services that we were using, and that was really necessary in order for us to grow the event. Um, and we uh, normally, we would have had that covered had sponsorship gone the way we planned, but it didn't. So anyway, I just wanted to sort of share uh, that with folks so they can um, get a sense of the funding. I'll pass it off to Mark. Oops, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself there. Um, so very similar uh, story for, for us, except on a much smaller scale. Um, some, some budgetary numbers here uh, for comparison and uh, highlighted uh, in red um, where we had a lot of in-kind contributions, and the, the budget is in many ways uh, biased. Um, we wanted to make the event accessible um, to anyone who wanted to participate and not have to have them pay, as well as uh, keep the ticket cost very low. And the only way that we were able to do that is through some sponsorship and some grant money and a lot of in-kind contributions. Um, so we have very low operating expenses and essentially no uh, venue uh, expenses to, to have this event. Um, we're hoping to use these last two years as a springboard to grow this into something much larger um, now that we have a better idea of who's interested, what it's going to cost, um, and how to really uh, organize and, and coordinate a successful event. Um, on the right, you can see some of the sponsors um, and uh, the, the Primary sponsors and participants are really the people who are coordinating the event as, as well, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, we had five uh, individuals, uh, Sarah and Anne, who were also on the call, who were involved in this event. And uh, it really wouldn't have been possible without our collective contributions, organizing um, and executing the, the event. So although on a smaller scale, definitely uh, our success has been uh, contingent on a lot of in-kind as well as grant and sponsorship money to be able to um, have this convening event. Thank you so much, guys. Um, and to our audience, we really wanted to sort of start out this webinar in the spirit of transparency by opening the book, so to speak, um, in the, right in the beginning so that you have a sense of the kind of resources and the sources of resources that um, these two events draw upon um, to put on these events. So with that, we're going to move on to the next uh, segment, which is 
organizing. So how did this take place? In particular, what were the kinds of human resources and processes as well as technologies needed to really put together these events? And with that, we're going to hand it back over to Anne. Okay, great. So I created uh, this simple timeline to show the evolution of the human resources required to run LGLB and then moving into PF3. Um, so starting with LGLB in 2002, um, because of other important activities happening at Fair Food, organizing local grower, local buyer is what I like to call the one month hustle. We, and by we, I mean Fair Foods office staff of just five people, uh, we gave ourselves about a month to pull together that event. Um, it was always nuts. Every year, I always vowed to do it differently, but I never did, and it always seemed to work. In, 27, in 2013, which was the first year of PF3, Fair Food and PASA, which was at that time our partner organization, we did all the planning, marketing, and logistics ourselves, so it was still um, all done internally. In 2014, that was when we started outsourcing things. Um, you know, we started by outsourcing things like the move in, <clears throat> excuse me, the move in and move out of the exhibitors um, and coordinating with the union contractors. If you remember, I mentioned that our uh, event was at the convention center, so we had to work with lots of different unions. Um, and, and some of that got pretty complicated. So we started by outsourcing a lot of the logistics. As you can see by 2016, uh, we were really outsourcing almost every aspect of running the event. And the reason for this shift over time was an understanding that we had that the highest and best use of my time and the time of my staff was the relationship building piece. Uh, we, as an organization, we're value chain coordinators, not event planners, and using our influence and social capital to get the right people in the room and set the tone for the event well, that was the part that we really couldn't outsource properly. And the more we thought about it, it was the part we wouldn't even want to outsource because that was a core strength of our organization. Mark? So going back to 2012, our convening event was really kind of a one-man show. Um, I was trying to pull together anyone and everyone I could um, to help us understand um, and define different challenges and, and close gaps to build a, a stronger and more sustainable uh, grain and malt value chain. And as uh, the years went on and uh, Deer Creek uh, started to build a little more social capital and uh, a network, um, we found uh, some, some people to help us uh, that had a mutual interest and uh, wanted to try and uh, turn this into uh, a, a larger event. And uh, like I mentioned previously, in terms of uh, our overall budget, that in-kind support is really what has allowed us to be able to have this event at the scale um, that we're that we're at right now. Um, a lot of in-kind contributions, and um, it, the only way this has uh, been possible uh, as well, just the way that we're organized by committee um, without really any hierarchy uh, is the fact that we all have some experience with these type of events um, and are, have been able to be flexible um, and, and manage a, a large workload with other responsibilities in our lives uh, and come together uh, on uh, bi-monthly calls is primarily how we uh, organize most of the effort to, to plan and execute the event, um, but not easy and really a testament to, to the team. Uh, I would say this structure in general um, without any hierarchy and organizing by committee is, is probably not the uh, winning strategy for these types of events. Um, you really need someone who can uh, take the reins and uh, drive a project plan, um, which is something that we're hoping to uh, be able to, to do next year um, as we uh, increase our budget and uh, and and hopefully hire someone to be able to uh, really drive a lot of the planning in the organization for the event. Hey, Sarah, I think I want to say one other thing while we're on this slide. Um, I realized that as I was explaining the the um, sort of the evolution of how uh, PF3 has been organized, I. I sort of made it sound like outsourcing the planning and logistics is like a simple thing or just something you do. I, I want to say, hearing Mark speak reminded me how important it is that 
um, regardless of whether you're organizing internally or you're outsourcing pieces of your event, it's really important that you are working with a team of people um, that understand your goals um, and that are, are driving value. Because regardless of your role, whether you're being paid um, to do planning and logistics or regardless of what your role is, um, it's really important that everyone is uh, has a similar vision and is sort of, you know, marching in the same direction. And I feel like Fair Food was really lucky in that we we worked with Kitchen Table Consultants, which is a consulting firm I now work with. Um, and the Jen Brodsky, who's one of the partners in that organization, um, she didn't just take our vision and uh, and execute. She also had a vision that dovetailed with ours and. Um, she really added a lot of value to the event, and we were able to see it grow um, and mature um, by bringing someone else on the team, doing that part of the work so that we as an organization could focus on what we do best. So I just wanted to interject that. Thanks, Anne. And I think one of the big takeaways, um, as we hear these two uh, sort of events compared side by side, is really that, yes, this work uh, can be done on a small and scrappy budget, particularly in the first couple of years, um, but that there is value in, in bringing in other kinds of resources, engaging and outsourcing some of the work, um, but that needs to be uh, sort of parsed and paced uh, appropriately. So, and in the, in the sort of long of it, uh, it's all complex. It's just about, um, you know, what resources do you have and being creative with those resources. With that um, and hearing the differences of how these two events are organized and, and sort of one with a budget and the other one with primarily uh, a volunteer committee, um, we're gonna move into the next section on strategies for engaging participants. And we'll see um, again, sort of the different ways that each of these uh, events went about approaching getting the right folks in the room, getting the right folks to come to these events. Okay, so I, I definitely want to take that first bullet, and I alluded to this in an earlier slide when I was talking about um, the transition from local grower, local buyer to Philly Farm and Food Fest. Um, so, there, it, so there's an inherent tension in addressing the needs of different stakeholder groups in an event like PF3. I mean, there may not be an inherent tension in every different stakeholder group, but there definitely was um, in this case. So back in the LGLB days, we had essentially one master, and that was the wholesale buyer. And as I had mentioned before, the event in every way was shaped to serve their needs. When we transitioned to Philly Farm and Food Fest, I swore as the executive director of Fair Food that the wholesale marketplace goals that we held so dear in LGLB would remain core to the event. So from 2013, when PF3 launched, through 2017, while I was still the executive director of Fair Food, I worked hard to keep those goals in place. But the reality is that getting 4,000 people to buy tickets and raising $85,000 in sponsorship money always took center stage. So what I, even though there was still a wholesale buyer component to PF3, um, and it was what my organization like we worked our tails off every year to make sure that that part of the event was really strong and that there was a lot of attention paid to it. It definitely, um, uh, it just, it, I don't know how to say it. It just didn't have the same impact as it did when it was a smaller organization more geared to the wholesale buyer. And I also want to say that um, I've been watching events like this for a long time. And as we were transitioning from a smaller event to a larger event, I visited some of the ones around the country that, we're doing similar things. Um, and, and this tension was not unique to PF3. It's something that I think everyone who's trying to do both a public event uh, and a industry event struggles with. I was thinking maybe I would turn it over to Mark at this point, um, especially to talk about, you know, personal show, social capital. I mean, I have things to say about that as well. Um, I feel like I've touched on it a bit, but Mark, do you wanna start talking and then maybe I'll chime in? Sure. Uh, our event also, I mean, difficult from the sense that they're, the, the grain and malt value chain is diverse and complex. There's a lot of different stakeholders, uh, which you can see in the three infographics here that uh, Sarah helped put together for our event um, in 2006. And uh, that was a big challenge for us 
every year, even when it was very informal, making sure that everyone involved uh, understood how they could benefit um, from uh, the convening event and what the future vision was, uh, really what that pitch is, which is a sustainable, viable uh, value chain um, that includes middle-of-the-chain processing that hasn't existed for a long time and new market development for farmers. And one of the ways that we did that this past year was include different tracks so that if someone wanted to learn more about baking or uh, brewing or distilling, uh, there were some breakout rooms for specialization uh, as well as some technical but generally applicable content uh, in a larger group setting uh, for everyone, uh, whether it was related to food safety or analytical testing or quality. Um, that uh, uh, we w really wanted everyone uh, through this diverse and complex chain to, to want to come and, and uh, to get value out of it. Um, in terms of getting people to come, a lot of it, like Ann mentioned, is uh, social capital. A lot of the uh, exhibitors, the speakers uh, have been by personal invite. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the networking um, to, to make this event happen has, has really been heavily driven by industry um, folks that uh, we've met uh, through trying to make malt over the past few years. But don't want to underestimate the importance of marketing, especially if you want to reach outside of your network um, and continue to build and grow. Uh, especially uh, for us in these types of events for consumers. Uh, and one thing we did was include a, a, a food and beverage showcase, um, which the event culminates in for all the different food and beverage artisans to share some of their uh, products uh, and to network and make it appealing for consumers who just want to come and enjoy some uh, craft food and beverages and a um, uh, cool educational setting uh, to come do that. So that's really how we approached it. And I think um, I'll, I will add one more thing, of course. Um, so, uh, you know, when an event gets to the side, so I, I was part of the planning committee that Mark talked about for Grain and Malt, and um, he's, it, you know, it was really his social capital, because uh, he's the person in the middle of that chain, as well as um, there was someone else on our committee who was also really well connected. And I found, you know, we found as we were going through the list of who we wanted to be there, it was often that Mark needed to make a phone call because he was the person that could really push push that lever. When an event gets to be the size of local grower, local buyer, where you're looking at 165 to 200 exhibitors, um, you know, you're not calling every single one of those people to get them to come. There's a certain amount of marketing and a certain there's sort of like, you know, a train that leaves the station and there's a, a lot that happens and, and vendors sign on because the event has uh, a history and, um, you know, a name for itself. But even in those larger events with all of that sort of infrastructure, um, every um, how, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, each each sector has its leaders. Right. So. Um, I, my job with uh, PF3 was often to get on the phone to make sure certain vendors were going to be there because it's, it's getting that vendor to come that will often mean that the other people in that community will follow. So there's still, even with those larger events, a lot of that sort of, you know, you know personal touch, making sure you're talking to the right people and getting them in the room. Thanks, Anne and Mark. I think I'll just say, um, to summarize, uh, maybe one or two takeaways from this particular section on engaging participants is one really just the distinction that in PS3, which its early iteration back in the local grower, local buyer days, was really focused on a particular segment of the value chain. In particular, at that time, it was more the wholesale um, side, so engaging the producers, the distributors, retailers. Um, and then in its later iteration, really opened up to engaging the end of the value chain, in this case, the consumer or the public. And just thinking about what that means, um, you know, for the evolution of an event and the capacity of an event. And I think for all of you out there who are thinking about um, doing value chain convening, it's important to consider, you know, again, matched with your, your purpose. Uh, of the event, which segment uh, of the of the chain, or is it important to have everybody there? I think in the case of Grain and Malt Symposium, which has gone on for two years now, um, and has again primarily focused more on the wholesale, although Mark had alluded to opening this new exhibitor space to invite some um, consumers in, it seems like a natural place to start from sort of setting the blinders on um, 
and being more targeted in your approach and then potentially growing that out. Um, I'll also just uh, pick up on the thread that I heard both Anne and Mark say, which is the importance of using uh, your personal social capital as organizers to get people to the room um, and to help them know that it's worthwhile. With that in mind, we're going to move to the next section on hosting, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, sort of the day of event and how sort of social capital in action takes place um, on the day of. Okay, so so um, I'll begin by saying um, that while we were on our planning calls for this webinar, we all agreed that the event day is a lot like a wedding, which is why we said that it's everybody's big day. Um, and if you've done your job on all the steps, um, the previous steps leading up to this, um, you know, sometimes I know I have found for myself sort of standing there in the middle of a giant room thinking like, well, what, what is there left to do? What, what do I do now? Um, and what I would try to do, and my staff and myself, we would try to remind ourselves to do, is to have a good time and to, to take that moment um, uh, to take it all in, which can be challenging when you were there until 3 o'clock the night before, getting things ready. Um, it was always really important to me um, during the event that I personally thanked every single vendor uh, and to express that PF3 wouldn't be possible without them. Um, you know, 165 vendors in the event. Sometimes that took me a couple of hours, uh, but it was probably the most important thing that I had to do on that day. And one of the things that I heard over and over again, um, both with Philly Farm and Food Fest and also Fair Food has been running a, a fundraising event called Brewer's Plate for even longer. Um, I think it's been like 15 years now, which also has a, you know, a large vendor component to it. Um, each year, the vendors, which are the farmers and the producers and the brewers and the, and the distillers, they would tell me that they looked forward to these events um, so much because it was their chance to see one another. And they would often use words like reunion, um, you know, to describe uh, what that was like for them and that they were really grateful to us for creating that. So, you know, that was never a, um, a goal of the event, but it was always one of the um, unintended consequences that for me, um, as someone working as a value chain coordinator, coordinator I found the most rewarding. Uh, then, of course, um, you know, being an ambassador for your organization is really important. Um, it's something that we always try to get our board to do um, and other important stakeholders of the organization to use events like this to, um, to just be there to represent. I'll pass it off to Mark. So the Green and Malt Symposium, like I mentioned, uh, really truly an outstanding team. Um, and even though we uh, approached it as a committee, we, we did a pretty good job with a uh, project plan and uh, defining roles and responsibilities leading up to the event, including event day, uh, to make sure everyone knew what it was they were responsible for uh, to allow us to really um, uh, host a great event and uh, be able to uh, enjoy it without running around uh, too much uh, like we were on fire. Um, in addition to having really good host sites, so one of our, our customers, um, a distillery, uh, was gracious enough to open up their space for a networking social the night before the event this past year, which was a really great uh, way for people to uh, network and uh, a chat before the event in a cool um, uh, setting, and then the, the day of the seminar itself, the University of Sciences uh, has uh, resources and uh, a staff uh, that, that made it really easy. Um, a large conference room and uh, a foyer, uh, which you can see a picture of in the, the, the top uh, of the two images on the right of your screen right now. Um, that really worked well for a showcase of the different food and beverage artisans um, to, to showcase their products and network uh, following a lot of the, the, the talks that day. And uh, definitely a, a testament to uh, our collective social capital as well. Um, everyone that was there was there um, because of the work that we had put in and, and the connections that we had made, uh, whether old or new. And, um, uh, we're still learning and, and growing, but uh, I think we've we've, we've got a, a, a good handle on how to host, uh, assuming we can get our, our ducks in a row with uh, uh, some of the other activities leading up to the, the convening event at this at a future scale, <laughs> uh, where we want to have even more people participate in these things. Thanks, 
so much, Anne and Mark. And I think, again, here, the takeaway from um, the hosting really is that while it takes social capital to get people to the event, uh, the hosting really the day of is the time when the social capital can recharge. And so it's while it might be tempting to have your day as an organizer completely booked up, I think Anne and Mark have both spoken to the importance of making the time to be present and um, enjoy those relationships and foster and develop new ones. With that, uh, I'm going to move on to our sort of last section uh, that we're going to talk about today, although it's a bit of a big one, and it's uh, on evaluation. And in this segment, we're going to invite you to think about impact outside of the box. And so before we talk a little bit about the design and results of the kind of data that we collected from these events, I just want to stimulate your thinking with uh, this question regarding evaluation. And this is a question that we asked, and it helped to guide how we structured the evaluation for these events. And the question is, evaluation for whom and evaluation for what purpose? I suppose it's actually sneakily two questions in there. But the way that we sort of thought about this um, and answered this question is thinking about the different kinds of uh, stakeholder groups who are interested in evaluation. Um, and also, uh, you know, what are their goals? Because they are different. And so for us, thinking about attendees as a stakeholder group, um, ourselves as organizers, and then also supporters, um, that for each of these groups, we are interested in a by uh, an evaluation that gauges the satisfaction of folks who attended, um, that we understand the impact that putting this event on has for our own organizational goals, and then how do we connect those impacts to broader goals, such as maybe um, a funder's support, for example. And so before I go into telling you um, the comparison here of evaluation design for both Philly Farm and Food Fest and the Grain and Malt Symposium, I just want to um, highlight and say a little bit more about myself and how I was involved. Uh, for the Philly Farm and Food Fest, I was primarily involved as a consultant and working on uh, meeting needs of a funder who was funding this Farm and Food Fest. And so we were trying to design an evaluation around some pre-existing funding uh, outcomes that were desired, as well as some internal to the organization goals. And then for Philadelphia Grain and Malt Symposium, my way that I engaged was primarily as a researcher in which this was part of my dissertation research. And so you'll see a bit of a different um, academic type lens to that. Uh, so going into that, I'll move forward and show you here just the comparison. Um, in this slide, really, the takeaway is that we have different evaluation designs for the different kinds of audiences. So to start, on the Philly Farm and Food Fest, uh, our strategy was that we wanted to focus on a diverse array of outcomes for various attendee groups. And I'll say a little bit more about those various attendee groups, but what I want you to know uh, here is that we had three different surveys, uh, ones for consumers, ones for exhibitors, and then also uh, wholesale buyers. And so that was the strategy that we used. We knew we wanted to be really targeted, and those outcomes range from sort of behavioral things to some sales data and event satisfaction. On the Philadelphia Grain and Malt Symposium, we were really focusing on the relationship building, the social capital building as the primary outcome. And for this, we used a social network analysis survey design. And this was conducted at the event um, in a paper format, actually. So it's a bit experimental, and we'll get into those uh, results um, coming up next. And so here to begin with are the results from, or at least highlighted results from the uh, Philadelphia uh, Farm and Food Fest. I think the takeaway that I'd like to share here is that you see those three um, survey sort of attendee groups, and those were the three distinct surveys we had. And you can see that the topics that we asked questions about um, were unique to some of these groups, and some of them overlapped. And then on the uh, right hand side, this is some of the ways that we were able to take the uh, data from each of those groups and report them. So, for example, things that we thought were interesting were uh, how many exhibitors uh, came and how, much, how many more exhibitors, these are um, farmers or processors showing their food, giving out samples, what was that increase from previous years? We also were really interested in the revenue that these exhibitors were able to report in sales made at the event. Um, we know that this is 
certainly a marketing touch point, but they are also moving product and that's valuable for us. In addition, the uh, piece at the bottom are actually around the participant and the consumers. They're engaged very much in Philly Farm and Food Fest. And so we were looking here at some behavioral changes, some new learnings that they had, intentions to try new food. And again, some of these were directly linked to uh, some funding we received. In particular, it was a specialty crop block grant in case folks are familiar with that. So then moving forward into the Philadelphia Grain and Malt Symposium, this is a very different strategy we used here. I mentioned before that um, the currency we were sort of measuring, if you will, was relationships. And we did this through using a social network analysis design. We were really interested in engaging both the value chain actors who we knew were present at this event, as well as the support actors. So those that were not necessarily buying or selling product, but they were interested and invested in the um, value chain's development. And those folks might be education, researchers, policymakers, et cetera. The primary questions that really guided our evaluation here were who is doing business with whom, who is sharing professional advice with whom, and how did these connections change from before and after the event? And so a few things to draw your attention to here is that you see at the bottom, uh, we, we do have some very basic numbers that before the event, this was the reported business connections as well as advice connections. And then after the event, uh, it increased. You're gonna see some low numbers here because this is an experimental design. And so we only had uh, less than actually half of all attendees take this survey, which is a limitation um, for these numbers. It, however, doesn't uh, preclude us from saying that, you know, in fact, uh, impact did take place. And if anything, what we're showing here is that if we're, even if we just show you that there's this kind of significance happening, we can sort of extrapolate that there were even more connectivity um, connection points taking place. So to give you a little more detail and not just uh, say, sort of show the numbers, but to actually show you where the connection was made in the value chain, I'm going to show you um, a social network map uh, of the connections in this event. And so this slide is a lot to take in. And so I'm just gonna help to guide your eyes to what you're looking at here. So first of all, from the left to the right, you're looking at a before and after picture of those advice and business ties um, reported here at the event. Just in case you've never seen a social network analysis map before, to orient you, the squares represent individual businesses and the lines are connections. The squares are actually color coded by the value chain categories. And so remember we talked before about that direct actors versus support actors. The direct actors in the value chain, those who are actually buying or selling something are in the white segment and the support actors such as education, lenders, policy and coordinators are in the grayed out section. It's also just to help point, um, point your eyes here to what's going on in each of those uh, sort of before and after pictures, the value chain actors move from left to right. So it starts with, and they're grouped together. So the brown are input suppliers, the green are producers, maltsters, and so on and so forth. And so here we're able to just see both the connectivity taking place linearly along the chain, as well as vertically to the support there's a lot that we could say about uh, social network analysis and truly the, um, all the detail of these uh, pictures could be explained in a much more in-depth conversation. But for today, I just wanna highlight a few uh, important things, which is that doing a network analysis like this allows us to see both patterns of connectivity among the entire network, as well as it points out individuals of interest. For example, who has a lot of ties and who doesn't? or who are the quote unquote big winners that maybe didn't have any ties but made several um, or became sort of the ones with the most ties after the event. I also wanna say something about network analysis as both a tool for evaluation. In, a, in essence, this is um, the anecdotal, we know anecdotally that social capital is important. This is the, where the rubber meets the road and sort of trying to put some more quantitative and tangible measures on exactly what social capital development looks like at these events. And so in this way, uh, this tool is not only backwards looking and saying look, that there was impact and evaluation um, in the progress that was made through social capital development, but a social network analysis map like this can also be used for forward planning. In particular, these kinds of maps can be used by event organizers to develop interventions about where to have new strategies and engage partners moving forward from the event. There's a lot of other detail I'm sure that 
um, folks might want to take in for this slide. So you can screenshot it, and I'm also happy to answer questions about this um, specifically offline from this uh, webinar as well, as it's a bit of a um, beast unto, it, unto itself. So just two, very quickly, two other kinds of, um, of impacts that we tracked from the Grain and Malt Symposium. This is just a sort of geospatial um, analysis. And what's really fun about this is that we use open source software uh, in Batch Geo. And we wanted to understand essentially the business and organization reach of who were the participants at this Grain and Malt Symposium. Again, using the value chain framework, the results here show our participants in the categories, such as resource support, maltsters, producers, distillers, and so on and so forth. Again, I'll just reiterate briefly that this is another tool for both evaluation of who was engaged as well as potential engagement for the future. And then the final slide I'll show you in terms of um, data is this is kind of a more emergent and sort of advanced tool, I would say. This is the blending of what it looks like to combine both network analysis ties, so who are the new ties that were formed, and, and do that in combination with geospatial data. Again, this is another tool potentially very interesting for future engagement um, and just tracking not only the what, but the where of the impact of this event. Um, I'm gonna open the floor just briefly for Anne and Mark to say anything else about evaluation before I conclude with a few tips. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I would like to say, I've expressed this to Sarah before, that um, this kind of evaluation, especially the that crazy looking you know, with all the lines, the network mapping um, is the kind of thing that if if uh, Fair Food had had that kind of analysis back in the local grower, local buyer days, when when as an organization, our role was to 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 intervene. What we were trying to do is get everybody in a room, get them to make connections, and then it was our goal to in between events from year to year to do all you know, grease all the grooves that needed greasing, so that people would be doing would do business together. But without a tool for knowing who talked to who and, you know, um, where all those lines were, um, it was very challenging. And we uh, we were so aware of the fact that there was so much good stuff happening in that event that we couldn't get our arms around uh, because we we're just we were just five people in a room of, you know, 400 people or 300 people and, um, you know, couldn't be at every conversation. So, I, you know, the value of that is so uh, great. And And anyway, that's all. Yeah, I'll just add that the evaluation portion and quantitating the value that the convening events uh, bring uh, is important for uh, understanding any gaps or opportunities for improvement, but uh, also really for, for fundraising um, and the outputs that Shara, that Sarah was sharing uh, are going to be really helpful for us to uh, solicit additional funding to try and grow this event and improve our budget so that we can create um, not only a sustainable and viable long-term uh, uh, grain and malt value chain, but an event that can help um, support and uh, and continue to build it in the future. So these uh, these analytics are, are going to be critical for that. So I'll just conclude by um, just a, a few basic tips here, which is that um, we would encourage, as we have done here, that really the goals, the unique goals and purpose of your event should guide the design of your evaluation and to remember those three different kinds of stakeholder groups, and also consider really what is the value add that your particular event is bringing. Um, we hope that this has sort of been illustrative of the kinds of out of the box thinking of evaluation, as well as maybe combina combinations with traditional metrics to help you think about measuring the impact of your convening event. Sort of the evaluation pro tip that we'll leave you with is that evaluation starts at registration. In fact, we would suggest it starts even before registration. And on this slide here to the right, this is a screenshot of the Grain and Malt Symposium online registration in which we already began um, capturing data uh, such as the business zip code and their um, position in the value chain. And that was used to create some of those geospatial maps. So just wanted to get your um, minds kind of going on that. And hopefully um, this has inspired you to think a little bit more about different metrics that you might um, consider in your own work. And finally, I'll just say that there are some forthcoming resources at the wallacecenter.org um, at that following link, 
especially if you're interested on the relationship tracking, such as social network analysis, um, sort of tips for doing this on your own. And with that, we're going to pass it on to um, uh, Ellie, I think, and we're going to move into the Q&A and just, um, I'm sorry, actually, I think we're going to have like a moment or two of closing remarks. I apologize. And if someone could advance the slide, thank you. I didn't remember that we were going to have closing remarks. Um, I guess what I'll say, I'll just give a brief update. Um, Philly Farm and Food, I'm no longer at Fair Food. I left in July of 2017. Uh, the event is happening this year, but they moved it to the fall. So normally it would have already happened, but the uh, people running Fair Food now decided to move it to the fall. And my understanding is that that's really about a commitment to um, an even more robust um, uh, sort of consumer-focused event. I, before, it was... Um, in the late spring because we were still trying to make those connections with wholesale buyers and growers sort of at the beginning of the season. But I think that um, for those who are running the organization now, the consumer part of the event is, is just more important. So um, I know it's going to be outside and I think it's going to be even bigger and I'm looking forward to attending. Um, since, uh, since I left Fair Food, uh, I did open a, uh, a my own business. I'm now running a wholesale cheese distribution business. So that's what I'm doing now. Mark? Um, I, I guess I can confirm your, your suspicions about the, uh, the, the PF3 event. Uh, Deer Creek's participated in the event for the last uh, two years, and we will again this fall. And it definitely has become a little more consumer-focused. Um, we're going to be showcasing a lot of our, our malt ingredients uh, in a beer garden as one example of a way that they're trying to engage with consumers uh, on a larger scale uh, in a different venue. Uh, for us, we're, we're definitely going to be continuing to try and uh, improve and grow the Grain and Malt Symposium. Um, uh, one big gap in the budget, like I mentioned, is the, the, the in-kind contributions of the, the organizers. Um, if you put a dollar value around our time this past year, the event would have been a, a su substantial loss. So we're, we're hoping to secure additional funding uh, and uh, be able to compensate uh, uh, one or, or several folks who can uh, help uh, really build and grow the event and continue to deliver value um, to the, the grain and, and malt value chain. Uh, Deer Creek is uh, also growing uh, as a business. We're uh, adding capacity, uh, creating uh, new specialty ingredients uh, for both food and uh, beverage markets, and uh, still trying to maintain our image as an agricultural producer and processor uh, and not become a large commodity organization, um, but uh, continue to add value to grain, uh, that we then uh, pass on to uh, uh, brewers, bakers, distillers. We've got some confectionaries and uh, other uh, food artisans who are using our, our malt ingredients in, in pretty cool and exciting ways, which is, is fun to see. So um, uh, thanks for letting me share some of our story. And uh, the, the Malt Symposium is many convening events that, that we do um, to support our business and uh, something that we get a lot of gratitude out of. It's really cool to uh, see everyone uh, in a space like we create at the Grain and Malt Symposium during that showcase, uh, talking about their products and sharing them with other people in the value chain. Um, it's a really a pretty special thing. So thanks so much uh, for all of your attention as we've uh, gone through this journey. And uh, we just wanted to sort of jog your memory of the steps that we've talked about today. And even though we've talked about them again in a linear fashion, we do want to reiterate um, that there's certainly different sequencing that makes sense um, depending on the kind of event that you're putting on. But we now invite uh, question and answers. We'd be happy to talk more about anything that piqued your interest today. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys so much for uh, letting us look under the hood of these events. I was looking at them thinking it seems like I missed some good parties. Um, if you all haven't submitted any questions yet, remember that you can do it uh, via the questions box in your uh, webinar software. That should be on the right-hand side. We do have lots to get through, and we have about 15 minutes, so we'll, we'll dive right in. Um, 
one of the questions that came in from Cliff, which I thought was really interesting, is how do you vet sponsors? What do you look for? How do you know your values are aligned? A little bit about, about the process of finding people to give you some money for your event. Hmm. That is such a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, and oh my gosh. And, and one that my organization has grappled with, what my old organization has grappled with a lot over the years, um, actually even less with this event than other events that Fair Food does. Um, uh, anyway, but, uh, but sticking with this one, um, uh, I don't know where to begin. Um, I, I, for Philly Farm and Food Fest, we knew sort of already who, who we were targeting to be sponsors for the event. We didn't have, um, it's not like, it's not really so much that like people, that people solicited us and then we had to look into their values. I mean, we knew that we were going to get some flack from some people about um, Whole Foods and Chipotle as, as our main sponsors because of where they don't always align with the goals of a, a lot of local food systems supporters. But honestly, we turned to our exhibitors. That was really the guide for us. Um, and uh, our exhibitors who were the farmers and producers really cared about Whole Foods. And we even learned from some of our exhibitors um, some of our vendors that they were there because Whole Foods was there because Whole Foods was their biggest customer and they wanted to be there in support of them. Mm -hmm. So that, that was, uh, that's probably the quickest way for me to answer that question. Great. Um, yeah. Sorry. No, <laughs> that was long, great. Long. Thank you, Ann. Um, people in your network are oftentimes yeah. the best resource. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Sarah, we're getting a lot of questions about the, the analytics software that you used and how you generated those beautiful images, um, but also some questions about how people that might not be getting a PhD in sociology could, could use some of those same tools. And I know um, Sarah had mentioned that Wallace Center is partnering with Sarah to come up with some resources to help people who might not be as technologically sophisticated as she is uh, figure out how to create those things. But any, any shorthand tips and tricks that you could share, Sarah, before or um, those hard resources are available on our website. Yeah, just really briefly for the network analysis that was done in what's called UCI Net uh, Analytic Technologies is the creator of that software. And the images were created in the visualization companion of that called NetDraw. Uh, that's by Steve Borgatti. If you want, can look that up, you can also email me for these. Um, and then the so the geospatial, um, the first one was open source, and that's batchgeo.com. And then the second one was ArcGIS, which is, that's the uh, network um, overlaid within um, the geospatial data. And that one's a little more of a heavy lift. And as Ellie mentioned, there is a resource uh, forthcoming. It should be ready probably next week, I think, on um, simple ways to do this. But please feel free to contact me. And we actually, from one of our presenters, um, he mentioned a, another social networking tool. That's kumo.io, which is K-U-M-U dot I-O. Uh, so that might be worth checking out as well. Thanks, Elliot. Uh, another question that I thought was really interesting was about um, outsourcing the planning and logistics of your event. And Anne, you mentioned that that sort of happened over time, that you decided that it was more valuable for you to really be on the ground and, and reaching out to people you knew and using your social capital. Do you think it would be possible to start off with the logistics outsourced or do you need oh, to? Oh, definitely. Oh, you want? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I, I um, might even recommend that. I, it's just, you know, the nature of the organization that I ran, we were just, you know, kind of scrappy was our middle name. We did every, we, did, we started everything like that. And it was just not in our nature for whatever reason to start doing things in a professional way. But I have a, a great deal of admiration for those who do. I would say I'll just right. add one thing, which is just be so clear about what your purpose is of the event so that you're not being dragged um, in, a, in different directions by people um, that are not part of your event, a part of your organization. Yeah, that's what I was going to share. I mean, if you've got a very clear event charter, mission, vision, goals, objectives, um, and you have the budget to be able to uh, hire someone to help. Uh, with the planning and the organization, um, I think it's definitely a winning strategy to, to have some of these events. It still requires some oversight from the people who uh, are participating um, in that, that value chain, but uh, uh, definitely possible. And uh, I wanted to add one thing quick with respect to funding. Um, we, too, looked at 
to the participants, whether they were the speakers, uh, exhibitors, uh, organizers, um, to help uh, with in-kind contributions, whether it was their time or their uh, their products. Um, but we also looked uh, a little bit to uh, the state, um, uh, the Department of Agriculture and the Liquor Control Board um, were gracious uh, and, and gave us uh, some, some money to help uh, subsidize our costs for this event. So. Thanks, Mark. Uh, here's another good one um, about PF3. So, Anne, you talked a lot about local food, and um, we got a question about if you are just talking about locally grown, locally produced, how you sort of drew boundaries around what fit that categorization for you all. Yeah, it changed over time. In the early days, I mean, remember the event started in 2002, and Fair Food was an organization committed to local food, uh, we had some, we had very strict boundaries. That really changed as our event grew and especially as the artisan food movement grew. Um, and I don't even, I, I, uh, I, I don't remember now sort of where we drew those boundaries, but it was something that we always looked at. Is that enough of an answer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I um, know that that's, that's a different question for everybody. So locally produced would have counted towards the later years of the event, it sounds like. Yes, exactly. Yes. Whereas in the early days, um, we were definitely, you know, playing more of the local food police. And in the, <laughs> in, in, those, in, the early, in the later days, you know, we were really looking to celebrate um, sort of the local food scene in Philly in a broader way, mm -hmm. while still, you know, definitely championing the local farmers and, and local food producers. Excellent. Uh, let's see what else we talked about. Um, here's a good one. So uh, the question says, if metrics are valuable for fundraising, how can they be used to increase sponsorship? And, uh, you know, hi, Sarah, you showed us some, some images of, of the ways that you use those metrics, but any other ideas about how to apply that to, to appeal to sponsors and funders? I think that's maybe for, a for question us. for Mark and Ann. Yeah. 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 I guess it's less about uh, our sponsors, which were the participants, the speakers, the exhibitors, the organizers, and more um, for a grant application. Um, we got some grant funding from the state for the event last year um, as part of a, a broader project, um, and we'll use uh, the, the the analytics. Uh, from this past year's event that Sarah helped put together uh, to renew that and apply for some additional funding to help grow the event. Um, so it was, it, my comment was more specific to uh, grant funding where I think that type of uh, data can be really uh, useful. Cool. Um, here's a good question about Anne. It seemed like in your budget breakdown, uh, the professional services expenses went up a lot. Can you talk a little bit about yes. what goes in that category and why it went up? Yes, absolutely. A, a couple things happened um, to make those increase. Um, one was that the event planners that we'd been working with, um, you know, we increased their scope of work and that definitely increased the budget for them. Uh, the other thing, and I should have mentioned this before, a, a really big deal for us at Fair Food in, tw in that 2017 year is that we paid ourselves. <laughs> um, we paid ourselves for doing the work, um, even though it was always understood that whatever was left over at the end was ours as sort of a fundraising effort. Uh, it was just sort of a, a sea change in the organization where we said we, we want to put a value on the work that we do, regardless of how much money this event does or doesn't make at the end. So th those were the two things that increased the operating costs. And why ours were so low. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, so this is a good question about evaluation um, and about whether or not you were able to monitor sales that were created between farmer and buyer and how you evaluate those things. I know that's a big challenge for value chain coordinators. Well, just I'll just start out by saying in uh, PS3, we evaluated sales from the perspective of the exhibitors. And so that was that would be sales at the event. Uh, we, I mentioned before that we use three different surveys, one for exhibitors, one for consumers, and one for buyers. So on the consumer side, we also asked, how much did you buy? And we got sort of spending breakdowns of what they purchased, um, average amount that was 
uh, spent at the event and in what category. So that was an interesting thing for us to know. And it helps uh, when we deliver that information to future exhibitors, it helps them know roughly about maybe what they can expect to sell. And then I just want to say the hardest category to get was when wholesale buyers came to PF3. We tried to get them to say uh, who they were connecting with and what they would buy. And um, they, we just had really poor luck, actually, um, getting them to respond. But in terms of asking, maybe the question is also considering not just at the event, but post event. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily data that we've captured, although I think it would be fascinating to well, yeah. um, follow up from these connections. I want to I want to say something about that, because in all the years I worked at Fair Food, uh, which was a long time. Uh, I, the, uh, one of the things about being a value chain coordinator that has frustrated me so much is that so often the thing that you do or that I did that was most impactful, I never heard about until like years later in some random way. And, you know, I, I have so many stories, little anecdotes of a, talking to a farmer that will come up to me and say, oh, yeah, that event five years ago, I met my best customer and we're still doing business to this day. And I'd be like, I do, you know, of, of course they don't know that I want to know that. But, um, it, you know, yeah, so many nuggets that you just will never know. Oh, yeah. that's not anything there. That sounded of, negative. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I, just, I think that one of the benefits of doing that sort of pre-post um, kind of comparison of who – who knew each other before the event and who did you meet is that you capture in in writing, if you will, <laughs> where it's canonized for all time that, you know, such and such business met such and such business at this event. And so the social network analysis in very many ways is really just the starting point. But once you have that data and you get the uh, additional information about how business does um, take take path, essentially, then you can um, relate it back to that initial meeting. Cool. Um, well, we are running just up against our, our time. Uh, as you can see, all of our emails are listed here in case anyone wants to follow up and get more info on the events or any of the, the social network analysis or evaluation tools that Sarah uh, was sharing with us. So feel free to reach out. Uh, and thank you again for taking the time this afternoon to listen to our webinar. Um, I'm going to give just a few little uh, news updates. Um, first of all, if you would like to revisit this webinar, it is being recorded. We post all of our archived webinars at ngfn.org slash webinars. We have over 80 now, maybe 85, uh, and they're all organized by topic. So you can learn from um, past webinars. We try really hard to make them evergreen. So things that we came up with, you know, seven or eight years ago when we first started doing our webinars are hopefully still relevant today. So feel free to take a look at those. Wallace has got a lot of exciting webinars coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, the most, uh, the soonest one is next Tuesday, right after Labor Day, and it's from our community-based food systems team, and it's going to be on shifting organizational structures for equity, equity and empowerment. So that's part of their innovations and leadership series, uh, and it's really going to be, I think, quite interesting. So feel free to check that out. Again, ngfn.org slash webinars. Um, we're also going to be continuing the VCC webinar series next month. And our uh, topic next month is market matchmaking. So how to connect two people directly as opposed to bring a lot of people together in a big room. Uh, so yeah, feel free to tune in for that. Um, then the last thing that I was going to say is, as you all probably know, um, we are in a very important season for the Farm Bill. Wallace is not usually a policy shop, but the Farm Bill is critical to our work and I'm sure to a lot of yours as well. Um, so the 2014 Farm Bill is expiring on September 30th, which is really soon. Uh, so that means that the new bill needs to pass between now and then, or they're going to have to pass uh, a continuation of the current bill. So right now the bill is in conference, which means that the House and Senate are negotiating the differences between their bills. And there are tons of policies and programs that we all rely on that might be on the chopping block. So we're asking you all to visit our friends at the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Their website is listed on that slide to learn how to get involved. Um, there's lots of letters to sign and phone calls to make. So please step up and make your voice heard right now. Uh, so the last little thing is that you can always contact us at contact at ngfn.org. And again, visit our website to dig into all of our excellent resources. And again, thank you for taking the time to hang out with us today. And everyone, enjoy your long weekend.
this ends the webinar.